The true message of Jesus as a title implies that there is a false message out there. And for us to determine what in fact is the true message, we must look at the evidences, the authentic and reliable evidences that can support any claim to be the true message of Jesus. Be introducing our speaker, inshallah, who will be giving a talk entitled The True Message of Jesus, peace be upon him, and that is Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Just a bit of a background on uh, Brother Abu Amina he was born in Jamaica in the West Indies and he grew up in Canada where he accepted Islam in the year 1972. He completed a BA from the College of Islamic Disciplines in the Usuluddin at the Islamic University of Medina in 1979 and an MA in Islamic Theology in 1985 at the University of Riyadh, the College of Education. In 1994, he completed a PhD in Islamic Theology in the Department of Islamic Studies at the University of Wales. From 94 to 2001, Dr. Bilal founded and directed the Islamic Information Center in Dubai, UAE, and the Foreign Literature Department of Dar al-Fatah Islamic Press in Sharjah, UAE. In the year 2001, Dr. Bilal established the Islamic Online University, the first accredited Islamic university on the Internet. He was a professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at the American University in Dubai, and University of Ajman, UAE, a lecturer and director of Da'wah and Education at the Qatar Guest Center in Doha, Qatar, and is currently the Dean of the Islamic Studies Academy in Doha. So I'll present, inshallah, Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips to give his talk entitled The True Message of Jesus, peace be upon him. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The true message of Jesus as a title implies that there is a false message out there. And for us to determine what in fact is the true message we must look at the evidences the authentic and reliable evidences that can support any claim to be the true message of Jesus we need to examine what I may perceive as the false message and its evidence as well as the evidence which I will present to support the truth. And for any Christian who truly wants to know what in fact did Jesus convey? Who in fact was he? Then I invite each and every one of you to put aside emotion because emotions blind. One cannot see the realities when one is overcome by emotion. Emotion by its very nature is important. We are emotional beings. 
we love, we hate. But if emotions don't follow knowledge and they precede knowledge, then we end up loving and hating the wrong things. Often, not all times, but often enough, we end up loving and hating the wrong things. So I invite our Christian guests because this, of course, is of most importance to them to put aside emotions today and look at the facts to get a clear understanding of the message which Jesus brought and who in fact was Jesus. There are two basic ways that we can produce evidence. They are from two basic sources either from the historical record, what historians have gathered, or from revealed scriptures. These are the main two sources. That is for those who believe in God. Of course, if the person doesn't believe in God, then revealed scriptures may not have any real significance to them. They will say, it's only the historical record. When we go and look into the historical record for evidence, there is virtually nothing available from the time of Jesus. May God's peace be upon him. A biblical scholar by the name of R.T. France wrote, No first century inscription mentions him, and no object or building has survived which has a specific link to him. In fact, the historical record is so absent of information concerning Jesus that there are among Western historians those who claim he never existed, that he was a fable made up. So then where do we go to find out about Jesus for those who believe in God? The only place left is the scriptural evidence. And the main two scriptures, revealed scriptures of what, is, what are recognized as world religions, the main two scriptures are the Bible and the Quran, which speak about Jesus. These are the main two scriptures that we can look into to find evidence as to what was the message of Jesus and who was the person, Jesus Christ. Now if we start with the Bible, what we find from the evidence gathered by biblical scholars, not by Muslim scholars, but by biblical scholars researching the Bible, they have come to the conclusion that much of it is of doubtful authenticity. We find a group of scholars in the UK, theologians, 
university professors in theology, Christians gathering a compilation of writings on Jesus into a text which was called The Myth of God Incarnate. It was edited by Professor John Hick. In it, in the preface, the compiler wrote, it is accepted that the books of the Bible were written by a variety of human beings in a variety of circumstances and cannot be accorded a verbal divine authority. He wrote this after saying, in the 19th century, Western Christianity made two major new adjustments in response to important enlargements of human knowledge. The first was the acceptance of evolution because there was a struggle between evolutionists, biologists, and the Christian church. And basically, the Christian church lost in the struggle. So the vast majority of Christians accept evolution. That was one major change. The second major change was that from the analysis over more than 200 years, it was concluded by their leading authorities that the Bible was not the Word of God. This is what this means. Cannot be accorded a verbal divine authority means it wasn't the Word of God. There were human beings who wrote it. They said here, in a variety of circumstances, at a variety of different points in time, by a variety of different individuals, that is the reality. In Newsweek magazine, some years back, in an article entitled, O Lord, Who Wrote Thy Prayer? O Lord, Who Wrote Thy Prayer? A group of theologians in the U.S., they, after analyzing, these are theologians from all of the major sects of Protestantism and Catholicism, they gathered together and they formed a group which they called the Jesus Seminary. The Jesus Seminary. And they wrote a text which they referred to as the Five Gospels. In this text, they mentioned the well-known four and what they did was they color-coded the text into different colors. One color represented the text which they were certain or reasonably certain that Jesus actually said. Then the next level of color coding were texts which were possibly what Jesus said. Then what was highly unlikely that he said. And then that which was absolutely certain he didn't say. So they gave it different grades with different colors. The fifth gospel was the gospel of Thomas, which had been discovered in uh, 1945 in Egypt, in, the, in Nag Hammadi, written in Coptic, a translation, 
and which had confirmation from documents of the first and second century, bits and pieces which had existed in Greek. Prior to that, people didn't know what these documents were related to. And it was after the discovery of that Coptic translation that they realized that these were bits and pieces of the Gospel of Thomas. Anyway, the point is, this group, the Jesus Seminary, they concluded, after analyzing the Lord's Prayer, what is known in Christianity as the Lord's Prayer, it begins, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, so on and so forth. Give us this day our daily bread, and etc. This is the standard prayer for Christians. Similar to Al-Fatiha for Muslims. Muslims recite the first chapter of the Quran in their daily prayers. So for Christians, the Lord's Prayer is the most central prayer shared by all Christians. And in the biblical context, in the Gospels, it is Jesus who is telling his companions this prayer that they should make. Anyway, the Jesus Seminary, after analyzing the Lord's Prayer, concluded that the only words of the Lord's Prayer which could be accurately attributed to Jesus, meaning it's highly likely that this is what Jesus said, the only words turned out to be one word which was Father. One word of the whole prayer which Christians have been saying for centuries, believing that Jesus actually taught this. Now the meaning of the Lord's Prayer is good. It has a good meaning. And actually from the Islamic perspective, from Islam, there really isn't anything contradictory Though the issue of God being the Father, human beings being His children, is something which one may raise objection to, unless it is used in a metaphorical context, and it's understood that that's how it was used anyway. So the meaning was fine, but the reality in terms of scriptural authenticity was that it couldn't be attributed to Jesus. And when you go through that text, the five Gospels, and look in the four Gospels as to what could be accurately attributed to Jesus according to what they said, it would be enough to fill one column of a newspaper. You know, the newspaper, the average page is divided up into a series of columns. It would only be enough to fill a single column, a little more than a single column. Meaning that the vast majority of what is found in the Gospels cannot be accurately attributed to Jesus. The Gospels themselves According to Dr. J.K. Elliott of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Leeds University in the UK, he stated in an article entitled, Checking the Bible's Roots, more than 5,000 manuscripts contain all or part of the New Testament in its original language. It has been estimated that no two agree in all particulars. It has been estimated that no two agree in all particulars. Meaning that you have 5,000 manuscripts and from that 5,000 
it is not possible to establish a single authoritative text not possible to establish a single authoritative text as a result and this is modern research he wrote that in the latter part of the 80s modern research shows that the well-known Bibles that are in people's hands today the King James Version being the most popular this version like all of the versions that came after it relied only on a few manuscripts they didn't use all of the manuscripts they relied only on those which went along with church dogma so when for example it was decided that a revised version of the King James was to be made the authors scholars Christian scholars who got together they wrote in the introduction describing the King James Version saying the discovery of many manuscripts more ancient than those upon which the King James Version was based made it manifest that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision of the English translation. Errors, mistakes, so many and so serious that it required a new translation and in the process what they did is they deleted texts and they added texts and with each revision they added more and deleted more so the text has gone through a series of revisions however as stated earlier by Elliot all of these revisions are based only on a few manuscripts not 5,000 but only a few so as such whatever they come up with will have questions on its authenticity the well-known verse which is used to show that Jesus canceled the law of Moses the law which required that adulterers and adulteresses be stoned to death that when Jesus came across a woman who was to be stoned he supposedly said let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her let him who is without sin amongst you be the first to throw a stone at her so of course the people who were about to throw the stones they all stopped because of course they were all sinners and this became the logic behind not punishing in this fashion and later it became in any fashion people who commit adultery because who are you to judge them when you are yourself sinners and then the finger could be pointed at the Muslims who still uphold the principle of stoning to death the adulterer adulteress that they are hateful individuals spiteful harsh individuals they don't follow the religion of love and compassion however the fact of the matter is that this verse was among the verses deleted from the King James Version why because they said 
that it could not be found in any of the early manuscripts. It couldn't be found in any of the early manuscripts, meaning that it was interpolated, it was added by copyists later on to create this new religion which we now know as Christianity. Another verse which is pivotal in the Christian theology is the verse which supposedly addressed Trinity where Jesus was supposed to have said there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. There are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. This was the evidence in the scripture in the King James Version it's still there King James Version in 1st John 5 number 7 this verse is not contained in any Greek manuscript written earlier than the 15th century when the first translation was made it was added at that time it cannot be found it was in that same period that it was added into the Greek manuscripts of the Bible or Aramaic manuscripts it was added in that in the 15th century earlier than the 15th century that verse a pivotal verse for the Trinitarians could not be found in any of the early manuscripts not in some but in any so with that kind of background one has to question the reliability of the Bible as evidence to determine what the message of Jesus was and who he was who was he furthermore to add more fuel to the fire when we look at the authors of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament what we find according to Christian sources that believe that the five books of Moses first five books referred to as the Pentateuch and this is what is referred to as the Torah that these five books could not have been written by Moses for Orthodox Jews, they believe that these five books were written 974 generations before the creation of the world. They believe that the five books, first five books of Moses, was created 974 generations before the creation of the world and God dictated it to Moses during the 40 days that he was on Mount Sinai that is their belief well from a Muslim perspective the true Torah was in the Lawh al Mahfuz was already written in the heavens like the Quran and all of the books of Revelation And it was the Word of God, as was the Gospel, the Quran, and all of the books of Revelation. However, for Christian sources, they don't hold that belief. 
they believe that it was written by Moses. However, in the text itself, there are verses which indicate that this could not possibly have been written by Moses. In Deuteronomy 34 verses 5 to 8, it states there, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no man knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. And then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Did Moses write those words? Absolutely not. It is inconceivable that he would have written those words. Furthermore, biblical scholars of the 19th century in analyzing the text of the Old Testament, they came to conclude that actually there was more than one writing by a variety of different authors. Some of the documents they refer to as J and some they refer to as E because of the fact that Jehovah was used for God in one set of writings and when these same writings were repeated Elohim was used for God. So they could see there are two different authors here. And modern linguistic analysis by Professor Richard Friedman, he said that the five books of Moses are a mixture of Hebrew from the 9th, 8th, 7th, and 6th centuries before the time of Christ. Whereas according to their calculations, Moses was alive in the 13th century before Christ, 700 years previous. So big question marks. Furthermore, the other books of the Bible, like Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, Esther, Job, Jonah, etc., all of these, the scholars say we don't know who the authors were. Furthermore, the Catholic Bible has an additional seven books which the Protestant Bible rejects, calls it the Apocrypha. So the Old Testament has great question marks regarding it. And the Gospels themselves, the same. As I mentioned earlier, issues about manuscripts is sufficient to raise major doubts. Of course, the language of Jesus was Aramaic, according to the understanding of uh, scholars, historians, etc., because it was the popular language at that period of time. And it remained, actually, the most popular language all the way up until the 7th century. And it was only with the spread of Islam that Aramaic was overshadowed by Arabic. The Aramaic-speaking peoples of the Middle East, whether in Turkey, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, these people shifted their major language over into Arabic. Even the Talmud of the Jews, the ancient Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmud are both written in Aramaic. So it's well known. This was the language of Jesus. However, the oldest of the gospel documents are, are written in what language? They're written in Greek. Greek which later became the dominant language of Greece and in knowledgeable people of Rome and parts of Turkey, etc. Those who are converting to Christianity, as promoted by Paul, were from Greek-speaking backgrounds. So Greek became the dominant language 
of Christians from the first century onwards. So who then wrote the Gospels? With regards to Mark, he is not mentioned among the disciples of Jesus in the first place. Nobody really knows who he is. Some said he was a Christian author. Some said he was a scribe and companion of Paul. Some said a variety of other things. Anyway, point is, who Mark was, God alone knows. And when you go to the other Gospels, which are named after disciples, Matthew, Luke, and John, these three other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, though named after disciples, Christian scholars admit openly that these were written not by the disciples, but by others who use these names in order to promote to promote these books in the early centuries. It's not surprising that when one goes into the texts, after seeing this level of inauthenticity, that the texts of both the Old Testament and the New Testament are filled with errors, among the Gospels in particular, filled with contradictions, where in one uh, chapter of the Bible it says one thing, another chapter says another thing. One Gospel says one thing, another Gospel says another thing. That is common. If we swing over to the Quran, the other scripture, what we find is that we have a text which is unique in religious texts. One which does not have other versions. Research done on manuscripts gathered, over 42,000 manuscripts were gathered in the University of Munich in Germany. The Germans were the leading orientalists studying uh, Islamic or Muslim manuscripts and writings back in the 1800s and early 1900s. So they gathered over 42,000 manuscripts, correlated them, analyzed them, and came to the conclusion that they are from one single text. They did find a few copying mistakes, but they were few and far between. And they didn't imply or indicate a different text. This is the Quran. One which has been preserved so much so that Orientalists like Richard A. Nicholson, Professor Richard A. Nicholson said, we have in the Quran materials of unique and incontestable authority for tracing the origin and early development of Islam. Such materials as do not exist in the case of Buddhism or Christianity or any other ancient religion. And many such statements, similar statements from Western authorities. So, on to the person of Jesus. Who was he? According to the Quran, he was a messenger of Allah. As Allah said, and remember when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah sent to you, confirming the Torah which came before me. That's what is stated in the Quran. We can find support for it in Matthew 21, verse 11. And the crowd said, This is a prophet. This is the prophet Jesus of Nazareth, of Galilee. And in Mark 6, 4, we find, And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. And in John 17, verse 3, Jesus is quoted as saying, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 
Why would I quote from the Gospels after pointing out its inauthenticity? Because of the fact that the general inauthenticity of the text doesn't mean that it doesn't contain anything authentic. Muslims do believe in the truth of the Gospels and the Torah and the, all of the earlier books, only that they have been changed. But how do we know what is truth amongst them? When we compare it to the Quran, we find that there is support for it in the Quran, then we can be certain this much is true from the Gospels or the Torah. With regards to Jesus being a man, of course the Quran refers to him as Jesus, son of Mary. And he's the only one who is referred to in the Quran in this way. The only prophet mentioned in this way is Jesus, Jesus, the son of Mary. To affirm his humanity, that he was a human being. And even in the Gospels, in spite of their distortions, we still find statements there in John 14 verse 28, the Father is greater than I. In John 20 verse 17, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, unto my God and your God. And we also find in Timothy, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ the man, Jesus Christ. So, that is who Jesus was. He was a man and a messenger of God. As regards his immaculate conception that he was born without a father, that is affirmed in the Quran in far more detailed evidences than in the Bible itself. However, Jesus performed miracles which led those who look back at his miracles and consider him to be God, it led them to conclude that these were evidences of him being God. However, virtually every one of the miracles attributed to Jesus can be found done by prophets of the Old Testament. And the various statements attributed to Jesus, like that found in the book of Revelations, verse 8, I am Alpha and, the, and Omega, the beginning and ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Such statements Christian scholars have correct, corrected themselves, confirming that this was not the statement of Jesus, but of God. And other statements attributed to Jesus where it, they indicate that he existed before being in this world, like Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. We can find similar statements found in the Old Testament as in Proverbs where Prophet Solomon says ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. So these type of metaphorical statements cannot be used as evidence that Jesus was God. Even the phrase Son of God which Jesus never uses to describe himself and others use it we find this term uh, used to describe many of the prophets of the Old Testament and even Adam is mentioned in the Gospels as the Son of God. Other statements like Jesus being one with the Father, being in the Father, he said the same thing to his followers that as I am in the Father you are in me. So if being in the Father meant he and the Father were one, then it meant that his disciples were also one with him and with God. The argument that he accepted worship, as found in John 9, 37, 38, 
Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This is the one verse which may be used to argue that people around Jesus worshipped him, or at least that individual did, and Jesus accepted it. However, in the American Bible, scholars who put it together put in a footnote for verse 38, which said that the man worshipped Jesus. They said, this verse omitted in important early manuscripts may be an addition for baptismal liturgy. Its origin is not from the early manuscripts. And other statements like in the beginning it was the word found in John. These are not actually statements of Jesus which scholars themselves admit. So if we move on to the message of Jesus. What was Jesus' message? We have to say that fundamentally his message was one of submission. As is recorded in Matthew 7, 22, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, he who does the will of my Father in heaven, also you can find in John 5 verse 30, I can do nothing of my own authority. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So the essence of what Jesus claimed as his message, what he was conveying to people was submission to the will of God, which indicates that that message was none other than Islam because Islam means submission to the will of God and Jesus affirmed the law the law of Moses he didn't change it he didn't break it and he said as recorded in Matthew 19 verses 16 and 17 but if you want to enter into life keep the commandments and in Matthew 5, 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, think not that I come to abolish the law and the way of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in Romans 7, 6, we find the opposite stated by Paul. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. This was Paul's claim. He abolished the law. He claimed a new dispensation, the New Testament. Jesus affirmed the Old Testament, meaning the message which was brought by all of the prophets of God. And Jesus, in his various statements and his practices, reaffirmed the oneness of God. He worshipped. He prayed. This demonstrated to his companions that there was God and there was one God. And when he was asked, about the kingdoms of this world and tempted by the devil. He said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. That's in Luke 3 verse 8. And he prophesied the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The counselor, Christians, commonly take to mean the Holy Spirit. But obviously, this couldn't be that here. Because they believe that the Holy Spirit was present in the world in the time of Jesus. Whereas Jesus is saying that the counselor won't come unless I leave. So obviously, he was talking about one to come after him. And in the end, to conclude, 
When we look at the way of Jesus, we find that his way is the same as that taught in the Quran. The way of all of the prophets. That way begins on a physical level with circumcision. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, Luke 2:21. The idea that God was circumcised on the eighth day is ludicrous. But circumcision is a part of the covenant with God. And Jesus didn't eat pork, nor blood, nor did he drink alcohol. Even the verse where he was supposed to have turned alcohol into wine, scholars doubt its authenticity as it's found only in the Gospel of John. The other three Gospels don't contain it. And he made ablution before prayers. And he prostrated in prayers. He fell down on his face in prayer. As did the prophets before him mentioned in the Old Testament. And the women of his time wore veils, hijab. They covered themselves. And he greeted his companions and those around him saying, Shalom Aleichem, Salam Aleikum. That's how he greeted them. And that's how the earlier prophets greeted. And he fasted 40 days and nights, not one day or two, giving up chocolates. No, he fasted, a real fast. And he was against interest, as it was forbidden in the text of Moses, in the Torah, in Deuteronomy. And he did not prohibit polygamy, though people have concluded that in Jesus' practice, what we find is that Christians practiced polygamy all the way up until the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. They understood it to be permissible. And the earlier prophets, whether it's Solomon, Moses, uh, Abraham, and the others, were all known to be polygamous. So in conclusion, we have to say, without a doubt, that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was a man sent by God as a prophet and a messenger to humankind. He brought a message which was submission to the will of God. It was the same message brought by all of the prophets of God, all the way back to Adam. The religion of Adam was Islam. Some may question, how can you claim that? Well, we know definitely it was not Judaism because that came into existence after the time of Moses. We know it was not Christianity because Jesus himself never even used that term. What we know is that Adam was commanded not to eat from the tree. What was required of him was submission to God, to obey God. Don't eat from the tree. And that is Islam, submission to God. But whatever tree God has forbidden us is forbidden to us and we should submit and not eat from it. That is the religion of God. And Jesus, a man, son of Mary, carried that same message and that message is preserved in Islam today. So for those Christians who would like to follow Jesus as he taught, as he received from God, then I invite you to come to Islam and follow the truth from God Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallahu khaira, Dr. Abu Amini Bilal Phillips. Inshallah, we have some time for question and answers. And just a quick run through again of the rules. Uh, we'll have one question at a time, inshallah. Especially in the case for this talk, we would love to give first preference to any non Muslims. We'll begin with the first question from the brother at the front, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Myself, Irshad Ahmed Punekar, I'm an architect by profession. 
uh, you made a mention in your talk that the Trinity is not mentioned in the older versions of the Bible. Now my question to you is that if it has been mentioned by some of the Islamic scholars as you also are a, have a doctorate, you might have made a mention of it in the paper, then what is the response of the present day Christian scholars? The response of Christian scholars regarding the divinity of Jesus, because when we're talking about Trinity, that is an essential aspect of it, is that Jesus himself didn't know that he was God. And that is why he didn't mention it and tell people that he was God. This was only realized after the resurrection. This is how they explain away the fact that Jesus did not address this issue nor call people to accepting him as God incarnate. Okay. So we'll have the next question from the second mic. Assalamu alaikum, uh, brother Bilal Phillips. Myself is uh, Muhammad Javed Ahmed. Uh, my question is that uh, we all know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, is the last messenger. Then what's the needs to Jesus to come back? If it is the uh, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger, and Quran has uh, confirmed it, it is sufficient. Then what is the need to come back to Jesus? Okay, the issue of the second return or the return of Jesus, second coming of Jesus into the world, which is a part of Muslim belief. This is the completion of Jesus' life cycle. Allah spared him the crucifixion and lifted him up. He was not crucified on this earth. So his return is the completion of his life cycle as all other human beings will live and die. His completion on the earth will be to come back and live out the rest of his life and die. Also, he will be among the signs of the last day. Because in the last days, the Antichrist, the Jal, will come and he will claim that he is God as people claim Jesus was God and Jesus will be sent at that time to finish him to destroy him and to end all of the issues regarding himself so the cross will be broken it will be known that it is false and the pig will be slaughtered, it will not be used for eating and so on and so forth and Jesus will live out his life as a ruler on the earth for 40 years and he will rule the earth according to the Sharia or the law in its final form which was brought by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he will not bring a new law he will not abrogate or change anything. He will only fulfill the prophecies and be that sign of the last day. Jazana wa yakum. Asalaamu Alaikum. My name is Sultanat Khan. I am a BCom graduate. I want to ask the brother that if I want to call a Christian to Islam and I want him to accept Islam. So is it important to compare both the religions and uh, prove him through the Bible and Quran that Isa Islam was not the son of God? Can I simply tell him that there is one God and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and Isa Islam is not the son of God, he was the true messenger of God. So will I be accountable if I don't compare both the religion if he doesn't accept Islam? To convey the message of Islam, it is sufficient 
to identify the central teachings, the oneness, the unique oneness of God, and that he alone deserves to be worshipped. And that Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, was the last messenger of God to humankind. And what is required of a person to be a Muslim? That is sufficient. The comparison is only for those who request it, who want to know. So if you're talking with a Christian and he says, well, what about this statement of Jesus? Either you have knowledge and you're able to clarify it for them. Or if you don't have knowledge, you say, I have no idea about this, but this is the teaching of Islam. Research it. If it makes sense to you, accept it. If it doesn't, then continue on your way. Your job is to convey the message. If you're able to clarify, that makes you more effective. We find in the Quran comparisons. We do find verses where Allah makes comparisons, describes Isa as one who ate food along with his mother. Why? Why talk about that? This is to clarify that he couldn't possibly have been God as it's recorded in the Gospels, similarly, that he ate food. So there are ideas and concepts being brought there to clarify that Jesus was in fact only a messenger of God. And Allah speaks about the changes in the scriptures. Allah speaks about the fact that Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad wasallam. So all of this directs us, those who have the time or the ability uh, to go and research it and be able to share this with others. As with the text of the Bible in general, the Old Testament in particular, Allah mentions there that people change the text with their own hands. This is something which was mentioned 1,400 years ago. Christian scholars only discovered that in the last couple of centuries, they realized that the text had been changed. So that indicator found in the Quran can be used as a means of clarifying to Christians and Jews that their texts have been changed. So we use it that way. If we have sufficient knowledge, we have sufficient information to share it with others. But the primary a uh, way or method of conveying the message to whoever is to call them to the oneness, the unique oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just before the next question, inshallah, we strongly urge if there are any non-Muslims here, you know, don't be uh, shy, come up, ask your questions. If there's anything that you'd like to ask, any comments that you have, you have a unique opportunity where we have uh, Dr. Abu Amin Bilal Phillips here to be able to answer your questions. So inshallah, as much as you can, we invite you to come forward, come to one of the mics, tell one of the people manning the mics that you are an Muslim and you'd like to ask some questions inshallah. We'll begin with the question from the brother inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. My name is Ludovic Bonilla. I am from France and I am traveling in India. And uh, my question uh, is about Joseph. Uh, Joseph in uh, uh, Christianity. Well, I read some the um, the surah and the verses about Isa, and uh, there is no nothing about uh, this man who is a, a pillar of the Christianity. Uh, I mean, Joseph was a husband of Mary, Maria, and so there is nothing about him in Quran. I, I maybe there is something, but I didn't uh, find it, and so I, I would like to know. Uh, what uh, Islam says about this, what you know uh, as a Muslim scholar about uh, him, because, well, I, um, I studied in a school whose name was Saint Joseph, and so if there is no mention of this man, who was he, and I don't know. Well, the issue of Joseph, referred to as Joseph the carpenter, 
Uh, this is not mentioned in the Quran. Uh, in fact, Mary, when she gives birth to Jesus, was not married at all. As to what happened to Mary later on in life, whether she got married later on or whatever, God alone knows. We don't have certainty to speak on that because we don't have any authority. Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, didn't speak about it, nor does the Quran speak about it. And these are our sources of uh, evidence. So all we can say is God knows, meaning that we can't say that Mary didn't later on marry somebody by the name of Joseph. She might have. And in their own historical record, he was projected back to have been her husband at the time of the birth of Jesus. That this was just a mistake. But the point is that once you say that Joseph was married to Mary when she gave birth to Jesus, then the issue arises, maybe Joseph was the father. In fact, in the Gospels, in Matthew and Luke, when they identify the genealogy of Jesus, they refer to Jesus' his father as Joseph. So you see the kind of confusion that is there in the text and the doubts would have arisen. To be certain that Jesus had no father, the Quran affirms that Mary gave birth to Jesus as a virgin unmarried. So that is much greater proof of his miraculous birth than what is found in the Gospels. Good afternoon, brother. This is Venkat from Hyderabad. My question to you, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, Abraham see the Lord into three. Could you please give me the opinion of on this? Well, uh, you're not quoting a verse. It may be. You're just making a statement. Yes. I, in my reading of Genesis, never came across that statement. So please, if you can get a hold of a Bible, and I think we probably have some available here, you can go and find the verse that you are trying to refer to, and then we can respond to it at that time. Fine. Okay. Inshallah, one of the brothers is just going now to fetch a copy of the Bible, so we can look up the verse, and we'll do justice to the subject, inshallah. We'll have the next question from the sisters. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Mrs. Fauzia Sheikh. I'm a teacher by profession. And my question to you is, when I was working in the convent school, Kamal Convent School, it's a run by nuns. I was asked to leave hijab. And when I refused to, they gave me a termination letter. And the other teacher who was a Muslim, she was also given a termination letter. And then when I went to another school for an interview, I was not allowed for the interview as I was wearing hijab. So what should the Muslims do? on such occasions and when the children are studying in convent schools or any uh, English medium school they are asked to say the hymns on Jesus so is it shirk? well you've asked two questions applying for a job in a convent school or working in a convent school where they have a particular dress code what can you do? If they have a dress code and you've agreed to work with them, then you have to go according to their rules. If you want to argue with them, well, that uh, Mary Magdalene and the other women around Jesus all wore hijab like you did, you can argue, but still, what is that going to do? Right? Mother Teresa or any of the other nuns are all wearing hijab. But if they say that the rule is this, then you're obliged to follow the rule. Similarly, children that go to Christian schools where they are required to sing hymns which may involve uh, deification of Jesus, etc. Of course, this is against the Islamic religion. We have to question our, those parents who have put their children in such schools because they are threatening their faith. Of course, God may not hold the children accountable because this is the action of their parents and their parents will be held accountable. And I can only advise that Muslims should uh, make a greater effort to develop alternative schools where 
uh, their religious principles and beliefs can be upheld for the children so that their children will not be exposed to teachings which go against Islam and which may in the future affect their faith. The first question that I asked, there was no dress code for the teachers. It was only for the nuns. Teachers were allowed to come in the civil. But there was a dress code, sister, because she told you you can't wear it. So that was the dress code. No, no, I was wearing a hijab. I know, and she told you you can't wear it. You're firing yeah. it because she's firing you because yeah, of yeah. you wearing it. So they have established their dress code. Whether the code was established at the moment when they fired you, or whether it was established before, that's irrelevant. The point is that they are in authority, they're able to do it. If you're able to, uh, in America, for example, if you were fired for wearing a hijab, you could bring a case to the courts and they would have to pay a major penalty because firing you for wearing your religious requirements is illegal. But in India, I don't know. I cannot speak of what the law will do to protect you or to cover for you. So, of course, there should be some law which uh, protects the rights because this is supposed to be a secular country in which people are allowed to practice their religious freedoms. So, hopefully, if there is a clause which allows for that, for you to raise a case against the school, then you do so, so that they don't do the same to others who come after you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Nawaz Satwilkar. I am a I am an electronic engineer working in Siemens. Okay, my question to you is: While referring to Bible, we as a Muslim can we refer to it as Holy Bible, and can we use this same adjective as Holy with Quran? Okay, um, that is what the book is called, the Holy Bible. If you want to use the term Holy Bible, you can use it. Or if you just refer to it as the Bible, you can use it. If you want to insult Christians, you could call it the unholy Bible. But I would say, as Islam teaches, that you shouldn't insult others, so don't use that one. As regards the Quran, using the holy Quran as a terminology is not acceptable in Islam. It is actually what we call bid'ah, or innovation. The Prophet وسلم, never referred to the Quran in this fashion, nor does Allah refer to the Quran in this fashion. Allah calls it Al Quran Al Azim, the magnificent Quran, Al Quran Al Karim, the noble Quran, and so on and so forth. It is described in many ways, but it never referred to it as the Holy Quran. So we would have to say that this is something which people are importing from Christianity and modifying Islamic terminology accordingly, and that is not correct. However, if somebody said to you, what is your holy book? You are a Muslim. What is your holy book? You say it's the Quran. That's okay. Holy meaning sacred. You say it is the Quran. But to give it the title, to call it the holy Quran, this we don't have the authority to do, and this is incorrect. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, brother Bilal Phillips. My name is Manzur Ansari and I'm an engineer. My question to you is, you said that statements attributed to Jesus can only fill a column of a page and Torah was also written centuries after Moses, peace be upon him. So we use a lot of prophecies from the Bible itself, from the Old Testament as well as the New Testament to prove the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how can we use these prophecies which are written after centuries after Jesus and Moses to authenticate the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the authenticity of these prophecies? The issue of using these texts as evidences, as I explained before. On one hand, if what is mentioned is affirmed in the Quran, then we can say with some authority that this is correct. We do believe that in what is called the Torah today, in spite of its rewriting, etc., uh, interpolations, changes, etc., all of this, along with the Gospels, that there is a portion of truth in it. We're not saying that it's all false. But how do we know what portion of truth is in it? 
it obviously is the portion which is affirmed by the Quran. So we use the Quran as the quality control for determining uh, what is acceptable and authentic from both of these texts. Inshallah, we'll have the last question now. We have a non-Muslim brother at the front mic, so please ask your question. My name is Langadesan, and I'm from a Hindu background, and I had, I've been exposed to Christian faith, and I have come back to Hinduism. So I am sufficiently familiar with New Testament. So actually, the idea, basic idea is, God is just, God is merciful. How he balances? Does he has to suffer? The whole New Testament tried to show that the suffering of the cross is a basis of grace. So my, my question is, why God will risk eternal well-being of many on a historical event and its theological interpretation? Well, that question needs to be asked to a Christian scholar or priest, you know, because we agree with you that the suffering which is supposed to have or supposed to have been uh, undergone by Jesus that this in no way could no way be a means for salvation for the rest of the world and their sins one person his repentance or his suffering punishment cannot alleviate others each person is responsible for his or her sin and they have to answer to God and what happens in their own life that is a result of what they have done what they have intended etc so we are in agreement with you that each person is responsible for his own sin God did not send his son into this world to die for the sins of the people of this world. We don't believe in that concept. Nor do we believe that God becomes a man, because this is the critical point also, that God is God and man is man. God is the creator, and the creator does not become his creation. If the creator becomes his creation, then he is in need of a creator. So this is the concept, the pure concept of God is that He and only He is the Creator without beginning and end. To become a man is to be created, is to come into existence when you didn't, when you no longer, you were not in existence, and to die, to be born and to die, these are the attributes of human beings. So from the Islamic perspective, we have no God-men, no avatars. God does not become his creation. So I think that's an important point that you need to take you know, out of uh, this type of gathering, what we have been saying with regards to the true understanding of who God is and who we are. So actually, if you take Rig Veda, if I'm arguing with perspective, there is no avatars, there is no ideal worship. The question is, if Rig Veda is preserved and Quran is preserved, we have to compare these two. There is no avatar from Rig Veda and you can't have any ideal worship. It rejects all popular notions of Hinduism. So, how you know Rig Veda has not been tampered? It is actually between Rig Veda and Quran. So, there is no avatar's concept from Rig Veda. Well, I'm sure that if you go to the historical record for the Rig Veda, when it was it first written down? See, the, there are debates about it, but we are the content. No, but I'm saying, when was it first written down? See, Western scholars say that it may be 5,000 years back, currently. Earlier they used to say 2,000 years back. Now they are shifting the dates. Yes, okay. So, so this is telling you, this is telling you that the writing of the Rig Veda is uncertain when it was written. How many times was it written? Who wrote it exactly? Who conveyed it? So you still have, by if we look at neutral historians analyzing the origins of the Rig Veda, I'm sure 
they will admit that it in no way can be compared with the Quran in terms of authenticity and certainty of origin. Sir, I agree on this point. So from Quran, I can get a lot of clarification about Jesus. But from Quran, I'm not able to get so much clarification about Vedas. Well, if it were important for you to get clarification about the Vedas, then it would have been in the Quran. The Vedas, like earlier books which were sent many thousands, tens of thousands of years before, God speaks about them in general in the Quran, that prophets and messengers were sent to all nations on the earth, and they brought the same message. Now what has happened is that in time that message became distorted. And I'm sure from your own research you can see the difference between what is in the early books of Hinduism and what is in the practice of the people today. And what people are teaching today, there's much change has taken place. So uh, the point is that because the final message came with Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, it was no longer necessary to go to the earlier books. Prior to the coming of the Quran, then people had to go to whatever was available to get whatever understanding they could. But with the coming of the Quran, the essential message which God gave to all of the prophets, those who wrote and their writings ended up in the Rig Veda or in other books, etc. All that was written, the truth of it all, is found in the Quran. So it is enough for you, it is enough for you to accept the one true God and to serve Him only, and to worship Him alone, and to follow the teachings as authentically preserved in Islam and be on the path to paradise.